Come on, give him a push. Good girl. In North Carolina, roughly one out of ten teenagers get pregnant every year. That's about 75 a day. You can do it. Oh, that is it. Come on. Hold it, hold it. Keep pushing it. Keep pushing, keep pushing. I say, do you have, are you dating? Do you have a boyfriend? They say, no, but you say, are you having sex? And they go, yes. Push. Again, right back on. Where have we come to that we have to use contraception in a 12-year-old? I mean, I, I, th I think we need to address that issue more than anything else. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Yep, take it in Come turn. on. Sometimes I feel I'm too young. I wish I had waited. Yeah. It would have been nice if I could finish school and have my own place. You know, a home to call my own. Along these rural roads of Halifax County, people know little to nothing about a recent study done by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That study contained both good and bad news. The good news, for the most part, teen pregnancy rates are falling. The bad news, North Carolina ranks third in the nation for teen birth rates. So why should the people who live here care? Well, like the rest of the state and the country, the number of teens in Halifax County deciding to give birth is increasing. That means one day a young girl is a child. The next, she's expected to be a parent. As we'll show you in the next 30 minutes, most of the girls can't do it alone. Sandy, now this next part, we're going to start to get you to push from the baby out. Long, steady push. push, push, push. Keep it, keep it, don't hold on. When Dr. Dwight Williams came to Halifax County four years ago, it was to try to provide state-of-the-art prenatal care in a rural community. That's him behind the face mask, doing what he expected he would often be doing, delivering babies. We're doing a fine job of taking care of pregnant women, but we're getting the wrong kind of patient, too many of the wrong kind of patients. What does he mean by the wrong kind of patient? The girl on the bed is Sandy Johnson, and she's 14 years old. So Sandy, no more babies till you're 24. It's 10 years, how about that? Around here, we list teen pregnancy as a problem. And so they have a problem of one being pregnant as a teenager. Push through the pressure. Push right through it. Push right through it. Push right through it. Push right through it even more. But with teen pregnancy rates falling, experts have turned their attention to a new problem, the increasing number of girls deciding to become mothers. Okay, you want to see me? Listen. Two years ago, 60% of pregnant teens chose to become parents. That figure is now up to almost 70%. Is this real to you, that this baby's going to be with you forever? They are girls like Sandy, who, at the age of 14, is hardly prepared to make decisions that aren't even easy for adults. What did your mom think about it when you told her that you were pregnant? She just said, I can have an abortion, I can have it if I want to. But I'm going to take care of it. She told you you were going to have to take care of the baby. So what made you decide to go ahead and, and keep the baby? Because they say you have abortion or hurt. Did you want to have a baby or was it you just wanted to have sex? You just want to have sex. Did you think about using birth control before? The day I went to the doctor, I was going to get them peas in my arm. Do you know mm -hmm. what those are called? Norplant. Norplant. You went to get a Norplant. And they took my spray. Sandy's best friend didn't use birth control either. That's her with Dr. Ricky Watson, one of the physicians at the Twin Counties Rural Health Care Center. Her name is Felicia Richardson, and she too has decided to become a mother at the age of 14. If you were to stop and think about it, um, would you have planned it to have a baby at age 14? No. So who do you think is going to help you keep the baby? My mom. So she would be at home with the baby, yeah. and you'd be going to school just kind of like you did before you got pregnant. Yeah. What do you think about that? Do you think that's fair to your mom? Mm. No. Think these girls are too young to be having babies? Yeah. Well, Sandy and Felicia are only two of hundreds about? of girls statewide, ages 10 to 14, who will become mothers in 1993. In most cases, their bodies are not ready, and in almost all cases, their minds are not ready. Larry Williams is a physician's assistant at the Twin Counties Rural Health Care Center. I mean, they're young girls that should be in junior high, still maturing and growing up. 
and they're now expected to be mothers. And I would say the mental problems are much worse than the physical problems. So how do you think you've changed now that you're a mom? While the medical world fully understands the consequences of becoming a teen parent, the teens themselves often do not. We visited Felicia Richardson at home just days after her delivery, and like many teens, she had yet to realize how her life would begin to change. What's different? Mm. Now that you've been through this and you have your baby, what would you tell girls who were thinking about having sex with their boyfriends and not using protection, what would your advice be to them? They better use something, call. Hey, they don't want to go through. Felicia claims she will follow her own advice by getting a Depo Provera shot at the clinic to prevent further pregnancies. Do you want to have another baby anytime soon? Mm -mm. And after learning the hard way that waiting too long can have serious consequences, Sandy already has. How are you going to make sure that you don't have another baby? I got the things in my own. You going to get a Norplant or do you have that already? I got it already. Let me see. Still to come in this WRAL TV5 News special, who pays? The teens? The children? and you. Who pays? Number one, I said that teenager who really doesn't know what's happening to her. And she doesn't realize what it means to her life. But she pays. Those one million pregnancies every year are costing us twenty billion dollars a year to take care of those mothers and their babies in that year, in that year where they're becoming pregnant. Don't have a teen daughter, or if you do, don't think she'll wind up here in a delivery room? Well, then it would appear teen pregnancy isn't much of a concern. Or is it? The state of North Carolina spent $457 million on Medicaid, AFDC, and food stamps for pregnant teens and their babies last year. Now, that's a lot of money, but what really alarms the experts is how rapidly that figure is climbing. In 1987, the state spent just $270 million on those programs. And that means the figure grew 96% over those five years. So who's paying? Well, you, the taxpayer, financially. But the costs go well beyond dollars and cents. At the very heart of this problem are human lives. Okay, let's see if we can get things going here. Teenagers are two and a half times more likely to die during a delivery. Uh, teenage mothers are also much more likely to uh, experience other problems with pregnancy. A little more. You can do it. Oh, that is it. Come on. Hold it, hold it. Keep pushing it. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Dr. David Adams. If he can't convince you that teens aren't ready to have babies, medically speaking, nobody can. Unfortunately, he usually doesn't get to meet the teens until they come here. It's just before 9 o'clock p.m. in the That's delivery it. room That's at Wake it. Medical That's Center. It. That's it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Wonderful. <laughs> Deep breath and do it again. This is where he met Keisha Hayes, an 18-year-old about to give birth to her second child, and Melvin Reed, her boyfriend. Keep your legs out. Keep your legs out. All right. Look. Little girl. After the delivery, Dr. Adams delivers a clean bill of health to Keisha and, for the moment, to Lantrene, her baby. But the medical community knows all too well teen pregnancy costs, and teen mothers and their babies are often the ones who pay. Those problems, unfortunately, are not just uh, for the mothers. Controlled for all other things, their children tend to have more medical problems. Even the children that are so-called normal tend to have more medical problems and visit the doctor more often. They have more developmental problems. They have more emotional problems. They do more poorly in school. Uh, they don't catch up either. So why, with all these problems, would a teen get pregnant? They're accidents, right? You might be surprised. At least 20% of teen pregnancies are intentional, and that number is climbing. Let's have a look. Big old boy. Hi. Hi, old pretty thing. My meet physician's goodness. assistant Larry Williams. He's one of the first people to meet with teens at the clinic where he works. They just want some, someone to hold, someone that's theirs. They want this baby to be... The, most of them are a little immature, but they want this little baby doll that's theirs, 
and a part of them and someone to love and hold. I find that almost as much as the accident. Nineteen year old Tina Lynch wanted her baby boy so badly, in fact, that after she miscarried six weeks into her first pregnancy, she tried again. You tried for two years to have a baby and you've never been married. Uh -uh. How come you decided to do that? I don't know. It's just something I've always wanted to call my own. Whatever the case, accident or intentional, teens are becoming parents, despite the warnings from the medical community. Fortunately, for the some 16,000 girls who gave birth last year, girls like Keisha Hayes, the state has taken steps to limit those costs. It's called Medicaid for Pregnant Women, and teens are eligible despite their parents' income. It mainly just pays for um, all your doctor visits, and um, that's mainly the main purpose of getting it, is to pay for the medical needs that you um, have to get. Those same services are available in all 100 counties. Tina Lynch was covered for all her pregnancy-related services at the Twin Counties Rural Health Care Center. But teen parents aren't just facing medical risks. In general, they're also struggling socially. A woman who begins parenting in her teens earns half the lifetime income of a woman who waits until she's 20 to have a child. 70% of teen mothers end up receiving welfare at some time in their lives. Much of this happens because teen moms, 50% of them, drop out of school and rarely do the fathers of their babies stick around to help. Tina Lynch dropped out of school in the 11th grade, and she isn't quite sure what will happen with the father of her baby. How old is he? 21. Which he has another baby somewhere else in Oxford. He goes did he to marry see that him. baby's mother? Mm -mm. So he had a baby with some girl, then... You and he got pregnant, then he married we someone else, uh -huh. and now he wants to marry you. Okay, I'm just trying to get the this yeah. chronology right. So, do you think you'll end up married to Roger's father? His name is Roger, too. Yeah. Do you think you'll end up married to him? I don't even know. And what do you think when you look at her? I don't want nothing to happen to her. Keisha Hayes has been more fortunate. Part of that is because the father of her second child has been by her side. Now tell me, what are your plans with Keisha? What do you see as the future for you two? Mm hmm. I think we're going to get married. I hope we get married. Keisha has also been able to stay in school. Every morning, she leaves her two children at her sister's house. Bags packed for Phillips High, an alternative school in Raleigh. And if Keisha can't leave the baby at her sister's, she can bring Lantrenay with her, like more than 10 other mothers at the school do. Welcome to Phillips High Daycare Center. Director Linda Carbone. And the goal for the nursery here is to keep students in school so they don't have to drop out because of lack of infant care, and also to bring students back into the schools that have dropped out. The resources to help teens vary county to county, but if there is consistency in this support system, it is the costs, the financial ones, costs that are consistently spiraling upwards. Dr. David Adams knows those costs, too. Those one million pregnancies every year are costing us $20 billion a year to take care of those mothers and their babies in that year, in that year where they're becoming pregnant. That's not counting the costs of them being on welfare after that. Those are the nationwide costs. In North Carolina, last year's price tag for Medicaid, AFDC, and food stamps for teen mothers was $457 million. Again, that doesn't include the cost of the families that go on welfare after their first year. But it's a catch-22. Remember, we're talking about human lives here. I don't see any other ways to get around it. We, we can't ignore these children. We can't just let them lay off and, and have no decent care and decent food, and we have to just do the best we can. Still to come in this WRAL TV 5 News special, our children and sex. Can we do anything to prevent these pregnancies? No single intervention so far has really proven to be uh, a useful thing. It's amazing how many kids will tell you, no, I don't need birth control, no, I don't have a boyfriend, but yes, I'm having sex.
If you believe in the law of averages, at least one out of every 10 babies in North Carolina is born to a teen mother. And over the next 20 years, according to the law of averages, that family will cost the taxpayer $18,000. Convinced this is a problem that needs to be prevented? Well, just about everybody agrees with you. What just about nobody agrees to is how to go about doing that. And without a concerted statewide effort, the costs of teen motherhood are out of control. From a bird's eye view of Halifax County, just about the only thing that stands out is how little there is to stand out. The county is rural, and points along the rural roads are particularly far apart. But if you were to stand in one place in the county, again, this is an average, there would always be one thing within three and a half miles of you. What is that one thing? It's a teenage mother. Mothers like the ones we've introduced you to tonight, like 14-year-old Sandy Johnson, 14-year-old Felicia Richardson, and 19-year-old Tina Lynch. Mothers who perhaps would rather still be children. I don't know. Sometimes I feel I'm too young. I wish I had waited. Yeah. It would have been nice if I could finish school and have my own place. You know, a home to call my own. You don't like school? Most of the more than 16,000 girls who became mothers last year probably feel the same way, that it would have been better to wait for motherhood. So why didn't they? Well, in order to prevent motherhood, you have to prevent pregnancy. And that is something that our entire nation cannot seem to do. The teenagers are starting to have sex at younger and younger ages. Dr. Jane McCaleb works with teens through the Twin Counties Rural Health Care Center. She thinks that European countries do a better job preventing teen pregnancy because while sexuality rates are similar in those countries, birth control is more accessible there. I think we're basically putting our heads in the sand saying, if these kids just wouldn't do it, they wouldn't have these babies. Well, now that's true. They just wouldn't do it, but that's a big if. I think you have to always have a multifaceted approach, which is, yes, don't do it. If you're going to do it, at least be responsible for it. McCaleb's multifaceted approach is simple and straightforward. What it might not be is popular. When they hit 10, with a parent in the room, I explain to the parent and the child that in the state of North Carolina, children can get access to birth control VD information without their parents knowledge and I ask the parent to confirm to the child that they want me to be available to that child for the next 10 years to give them advice and what I tell the parents is that if your child's going to be sexually active do you want them to talk to an adult or nobody whether it's about abstinence or birth control, most teens don't talk to anybody, at least not about sex. And just who are they supposed to talk to other than each other? A lot of people say the schools should educate teens about sex. After all, that's where almost every teen goes on a daily basis. Bob Fry, the Department of Public Instruction. There's another one place, that's the home. Um, they all come from somewhere. They don't live at school 24 hours a day, of course. And I think it's the, the, uh, your interest in, in this conversation is in the area of, of uh, teen pregnancy and adolescent pregnancy. And it's real clear in the research in this, in this field that schools by themselves uh, can do very little. But it doesn't happen in the home, at least not with most teens. So who else can teens talk to? Experts say that if we could solve that problem, we could probably prevent a large number of teen pregnancies. Our children need different information at different times. They need to hear it over and over and over again. Vicki Gehrig heads the North Carolina Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program. Its goal, to give kids someone to talk to, whether it's about abstinence or birth control. If we can't prevent sexual activity, we certainly should be interested in preventing pregnancy and certainly some of the serious diseases that go along with sexual activity. But again, that's not always acceptable in a local community. It does go in the womb. It looks for the egg. The program funds 35 local projects and allows each project to decide exactly what will be talked about and who will do the talking. When you're talking about having sexual intercourse, you're also talking about a few dangers, okay? Not only can you make them pregnant, you can also catch something. This is the Wake County Brothers to Brother Project. And aside from answering questions about sex, it teaches abstinence to young males. And the guys that we're talking to, uh, they're between the ages of 9 and 14. So after talking about the facts, uh, they really understand and realize that, yes, they can say no. 
While the just say no message is by far the most popular in the prevention projects, it is hardly the rule. Well, one, you have to, while you're in the program, you have to get some kind of birth control so you can avoid another pregnancy. Second, you have to go, you have to go back to school and get your education. Tammy Jackson, mother of two, is part of a project called Cycle Busters that focuses on preventing repeat pregnancies. And for girls like Tammy, the program has helped make dreams seem more and more realistic. I'm going to start my own law firm. Hope That's my dream, to start my own law firm and to give my kids things that I didn't have in life. Give them a nice home. Instead of growing up in the projects, give them a nice home. So if these programs are working, what's the problem? We're talking about trying to cure a problem with just a tiny little, little bit of money, a tiny little impact. For every dollar the state spends on after-pregnancy costs for teens, it spends one penny on prevention. And while there's no question that more money would help, experts say it's not the only solution. They say the key is to talk to our teens, to send a message that in this day and age, sex can be costly. Sex doesn't get you what you think it's getting you. It doesn't get you somebody who loves you. It doesn't give you a warm, cuddly baby that's yours. It gives you problems that you have to have certain maturity to deal with. Still to come in this WRAL TV 5 News special, how teen parenting affects you. Everything's stacked against them, and we ultimately end up paying for this. We know what works. We as a, we as a, a community, as a state, we've just got to invest more into it. Not just dollars, but the will to prevent the teen pregnancies. Unless you work in a hospital or a health clinic, the problem of teen pregnancy is an easy one to overlook. Many of you have never met a teen parent, nor a baby born to one, and therefore you don't think about the problems these children face as they become parents. But even if you don't think about the problems, odds are as a taxpayer you're paying for them. Now not every teen parent receives public assistance, but for those who do, the numbers are staggering. And if current trends continue, they may get worse. Twenty years ago, about 70% of teenage pregnancies were legitimatized through a marriage. And today, the exact opposite is true. Seventy-six percent of all the teen pregnancies in North Carolina are out of wedlock pregnancies. And when there is only that teen girl, she has few resources in order to survive, so she has to use the public programs. Barbara Huberman heads the North Carolina Coalition on Adolescent Pregnancy. Her group lobbies state lawmakers for funds to combat teen pregnancy. How are they doing? Pretty well, if you look at teen pregnancy rates. For the past three years, they've been going down. But the coalition has other concerns. At the top of the list is the large number of teens deciding to give birth, children trying and often failing at becoming parents. What we're also seeing as a trend is that the costs of teen pregnancy have multiplied astronomically. More and more teens need public assistance, need public programs, publicly funded programs in order to make it as a teen parent. Those publicly funded programs are paid for by tax dollars, your tax dollars. And how much are you paying? We told you earlier that last year North Carolina spent $457 million on families started by teens. That's about $120 per taxpayer. The money funds programs like Medicaid, food stamps, and aid to families with dependent children. For these three programs, the average allotment to one teen for the first year of her baby's life was $15,244. That includes prenatal care and the baby's delivery. Everything's stacked against them, and we ultimately end up paying for that. So yes, you and I definitely should have an interest in preventing uh, this. Keep the legs out. Keep the legs out. Dr. David Adams sees teens having babies every year. What he has not seen is a single proven method of prevention. Like other experts, he agrees that the key is to talk to our teens, whether it's in our homes, in our schools, or in prevention projects like the ones we looked at tonight. The consequences of kids having kids are too severe to ignore. We have to be willing to talk to our kids about these things. We can't simply push it under the rug. It's, it's out there, it's happening, and if we don't want our children dying, we don't want them having babies before it's their time to do so, we need to, we need to be willing to talk about it.